Okay, well, why don't we initiate this uh, meeting for NAAP's public policy? Um, this is January 11th. Uh, thanks for all those who woke up and filled up their cup of coffee to join us. Um, if you guys watched any bit of the news the past couple of days, it seems like we had a long, good fall. So, and it was fun while it lasted. Uh, and it would appear that winter is officially upon us. Um, I do know that the ice fishermen and, and uh, the lake skaters are gonna be happy. Um, Donovan or Dave, anything that the uh, folks at the Kapler have? So when, when does the, uh, when does the, um, that ice skate thing happen uh, in St. Paul, you know, the Red Bull challenge? I think they canceled it this year, but Sean, I think one thing you might get a kick out of is because of the huge renovation taking place in the state office building, the tunnels are closed. So legislators are going to have to walk outside back and forth. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a little, little bit of punishment for, you know, expanding their footprint over in St. Paul. A little more baggage than what they normally have to carry. So, um, <laughs> Well, I'm a little bummed. Uh, we had uh, the tax chair, Senator Ann Ress, scheduled for the full hour today. And that was great. She was always a pragmatic person and who's generous, uh, really likes to listen to uh, us on the commercial real estate side. So um, uh, we don't have her. Hopefully she'll be back next month. Um, so we have uh, not necessarily the opposite, but uh, Dave will be presenting on kind of an important topic that um, is under the radar um, in, in kind of lobby laws. Uh, but before we get to that, um, Steph, I think NAP has um, quite a few good things that are gonna be happening here soon. So why don't you give us a rundown of, of all things NAP? Yep, um, so our first breakfast program of the year is coming up on February 8th at Golden Valley Country Club as usual. We'll be talking about uh, sustainability. Um, you should see an email in your inbox about that either today or tomorrow. And then we have our seventh annual curling event set. That's going to be February 29th, and those teams go on sale on February 1st, so in a few weeks here. So um, you'll be seeing emails about that soon. We've got a bunch of other programs coming up this spring as well. So looking forward to seeing you then. Okay, thanks. Um, Roz, I, I know before we get into the lobbyists, I thought um, we would just touch base on kind of one more serious issue that's actually at the legislator. And, and uh, I, I thought it'd be good just to preview it uh, while everyone's still on uh, for a minute or two. Um, and then uh, I'll let you um, hand it over to um, Dave. Okay, uh, thanks. There are a couple of items that are currently being worked on sort of behind the scenes that will affect a commercial real estate. One is uh, changes to contract for deeds. And um, the history of it is there have been some people whose faith does not allow them to pay interest. And quite frankly, there's been some bad actors that have taken advantage of uh, some of these people. And so therefore, uh, even U.S. Senator Tina Smith has gotten involved in trying to, shall we say, fix um, this issue. And um, however, it's a residential issue. And so when it was first brought to my attention, I said, Is it, does it affect commercial? And I was told no. And guess what? It does affect commercial as well. And um, and there's several problems with it. So, <laughs> so anyway, I am uh, talking to them, but just a couple of the provisions, it requires the seller to record the contract for deeds. So then the contract would be made public. And if the seller does not record it, there are penalties. It increases the cancellation period from 60 days to 120 days. And there are a variety of disclosures and sort of I call them redundancies it's saying and then you have to have another sheet saying what the purchase price is it's like it's in the contract and so it's turning a three-page contract for deed into probably a 20-pager with multiple disclosures which probably won't protect the people the very people that they're trying to protect and so um we're trying to maybe fix it from our, you know, from the commercial standpoint by maybe defining the buyer as somebody who will occupy the uh, property as their primary residence. 
And so it doesn't get into uh, how it affects commercial or, um, you know, just trying, I guess, to work through the language itself to just sort of maybe, you know, like one of the provisions is to add an amortization schedule. Well, that's probably not a bad idea, but you also would have to tell the person what they've owed every single year. And if you didn't comply with that, there are more seller penalties and having the the burden shift too much risk to the seller, I think it will hinder people from even doing contract for deeds in the future. So that's why uh, we're continuing to work on that with, along with the Minnesota Association of Realtors. And I have a meeting with them later on this morning. And the other item is property tax appeal data privacy. So um, it's rather complicated, but luckily there's lots of lawyers involved. And in essence, we still want to be able to utilize all the data, and, but somehow protect that data from going public once it gets into the court system. And I think we are, we're getting close um, and we have some draft language that we're sort of running up the pipeline and working with the county assessors and so that we can pass something that will fix it. Uh, the Supreme Court even said that the legislature needs to fix this problem so that the data remains public, but is still being, the assessors won't agree to not taking the data at all. So, um, and then the other side of the equation, the taxpayer has rights to see what data the assessors have if they're appealing their tax assessment. So. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. And if you have any further questions on it, please don't hesitate to reach out. And then Dave, I think you can take it from here. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about some recent law changes that uh, will impact uh, your interaction with local government officials and elected officials and appointed officials. Um, moving forward. Uh, so uh, last session, as you know, Donovan and I have talked about before, there's been a lot of significant law changes and uh, the changes with respect to lobbyist registration and reporting uh, was not an exception to that. Uh, probably the most comprehensive uh, reform or change to the state's lobbying law in, in, in two or three decades. And one of the areas that uh, um, where they uh, really did an expansion uh, is with respect to local government uh, lobbying, uh, your interaction at the local government level with uh, elected and appointed officials. Maybe we could go to the first slide. Uh, there's a uh, um, uh, slide number two, please, sorry. Um, yeah, so if you look here, the, the lobbyist definition uh, is that individuals engaged for pay for more than $3,000 from all sources in any year for the purpose of attempting to influence the official action of a political subdivision by communicating with or urging others to communicate with public or local officials is local government lobbying. And previously, uh, up until January 1st, uh, the local government lobbying uh, registration reporting requirements were pretty limited. They were limited to the seven county metropolitan area, uh, certain population levels. So it was really in effect the seven counties, Minneapolis, Bloomington, uh, St. Paul, and one or two other cities. But other than that, you were free to interact uh, with pretty much any uh, local government official, not only cities, outstate counties, but townships, regional rail authorities, and others without triggering lobbyist registration and reporting. So that changed. And so starting January 1st, this law now applies to pretty much every political subdivision division in the state. So that's all 87 counties, you know, 856 cities, uh, almost 2,000 townships, regional rail authorities, uh, at water conservation districts, pretty much any government entity uh, uh, that has been created by law or exists, uh, you know, is now subject to, to lobbyist registration and reporting. In addition, what they changed 
was the application with respect to the actions uh, and the interaction with local government officials that would trigger uh, registration reporting. And where we're seeing a lot of, a lot of discussion uh, is, is two main areas, lawyers who worked with cities on variances and housing developments and liquor licenses. Those folks tr traditionally did not have to register as lobbyists. Uh, and now uh, they do. Uh, the second area, uh, which is probably more applicable to this group, is, is if you have employees uh, in your companies uh, that uh, interact with local government officials on some of these same issues, and, and there's some examples coming later that we'll get more into it. And, and part of their job, in effect, is to, to engage in that interaction and to work on these issues. These employees now are subject to being lobbyists, and you are now subject to being a lobbyist principal. And there are implications under law uh, with respect to, to those designations that we'll also talk about a little bit later. But I think the main point here is that they've expanded They've expanded the scope to every political subdivision in the state, and they expanded the types of interaction to, to uh, significantly include uh, a lot of areas where traditionally uh, folks who interact with the government were not considered lobbyists. So uh, the next slide, please. Um, oh, the other way. So... When you determine, there are a number of factors. Uh, can you go back to number three, please? Yeah, thanks. There are a number of factors that have to be considered in determining whether a communication uh, with a government employee or a public official is lobbying at the local level. So the first is the purpose of the communication. So lobbying occurs when the communication is for the purpose of attempting to influence an official action, some form of advocacy, something that's before a city council. Uh, you know, so there are two different uh, types of communication, uh, direct communication, which is when, you know, you or your employees are speaking directly with a public or local official, but also indirect, which occurs when you ask other individuals, maybe, you know, there's a coalition working on an issue, or if you're renting the property out to somebody, you ask the, uh, you know, uh, the folks leasing the property to talk to a public official about an official action. That also uh, is considered a communication that can trigger lobbyist registration and reporting. Uh, a request for information in and of itself is not an attempt to influence an official action and is not lobbying. So if you're contacting a local government trying to understand what's going on, uh, you're not trying to influence the action in any way that does not uh, trigger lobbyist registration and reporting. Uh, but uh, conversations with others uh, uh, does uh, if you are trying to influence the action. The second uh, factor is whether they're a public or local official. And so public officials is pretty specific in statute. That's county commissioners, members uh, of watershed management organizations, soil and water conservation district folks. Uh, the second definition, local officials, I think is the one uh, where there's gonna be need to be more clarity. But right now what that de decision uh, definition is, is uh, any individual who holds an elected position in a city um, and individuals who are either appointed or employed in a public position in which the person has the authority to make, recommend, uh, or vote as a member of a governing body on major decisions regarding the expenditure investment of public money. There's been a lot in the <coughs> lobbying community trying to figure out what exactly that means. There's been a lot of interaction with the campaign finance board. Uh, for example, major decision is not uh, currently well-defined, but the board is working on rulemaking, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later too. But but there, I think what's important to understand now is the major investment of money is it's a vague term uh, and there's not a lot of guidance on what, what that means other than a couple advisory opinions um, that <clears throat> were issued in the last week. Uh, so the official action of a political subdivision 
it's any action that requires a vote or approval of one or more elected officials while acting in an official capacity or an action by an appointed or employed local official uh, uh, to recommend or to vote on a major decision of money. So those are the actions that are involved. So if you're trying to think through for your employees or others, what are the factors you have to look at? You have to look at the purpose of the communication, who you're talking to, uh, and what is the official action or, or the item that the government is engaged in that, that you are communicating with, uh, with them about. And they, you know, it's a fact by fact determination, as you'll see when we talk about a few of the examples in this most recently issued advisory opinion. Um, uh, it's, it's, it can go a lot of different ways. So maybe we can head on to, to page four. The other piece of this, and this is an important one, is compensation. So that's compensation to the person that's doing the communication. So uh, one of the changes that's an interesting one is uncompensated individuals can sometimes be considered a lobbyist. Uh, if they spend more than $3,000 of their own money in a ca calendar year in support of you know, attempts to influence local government action or official action, not including the costs of their travel expenses or membership dues, they can trigger lobbyist registration and reporting. And I, that's something I think a lot of people won't, it probably doesn't apply as much maybe to this group, um, but that is an interesting change because you know folks have a right to petition their government and uh, now they're gonna be subject to certain restrictions for doing so uh, if they petition their government too much. But for compensated uh, individuals, that would be two groups of people, you know, contract lobbyists you would hire, but also people you pay uh, in-house through salary uh, to uh, work on certain types of issues. Uh, if part of their job is attempting to influence legislative action, administrative action, which is, you know, both state and local action, then they're required to register when their compensation exceeds $3,000. So if you have employees, again, who, you know, interact with the government and you're paying them in part to interact for the government, you have to look at the calculation. Uh, and, you know, 3000 obviously is a threshold can be met pretty quickly, especially with respect to higher compensated employees in an organization. Um, so, uh, uh and it's from all sources. So, uh, you know, if you're getting it, you're getting it from two different sources uh, and you exceed 3000, you have to register as a lobbyist. And once you hit that threshold, uh, you, um, you have to register even if somebody else is not giving you less than 3000. So it's an aggregate level. The last thing I would point out is, and this is probably more relevant to, to folks on the call than it would be to folks like Donovan and I, uh, is once you register as a lobbyist, there are reporting requirements. So if you have, uh, if you have an employee that is talking to multiple, uh, multiple cities or counties, you do not have to register multiple times. You have to uh, just register once. But in the reporting side, and there's reporting that's twice a year, you will have to list each city uh, uh, and the, the official action that you're working on, as well as uh, the topic area that official action is related to taxes, transportation, uh, infrastructure. Uh, there's a broad list of categories. So, so, and that applies then even if you've only had one or two interactions that don't trigger the $3,000. So the next, uh, on the next slide, uh, I would just uh, try to talk through some examples of lobbying. Uh, the, the Campaign Finance Board has been trying to interpret this law since it was enacted in, in May. Um, and a lot of groups have been writing uh, to the Campaign Finance Board and they have a, a process there that is an advisory opinion process where you can write in, uh, state your facts, ask the question, and they will give you an answer. And you can rely on that answer uh, in any legal proceeding. Uh, with respect to lobbyist registration reporting, the state's gift ban, a number of issues. And so 
it's specific guidance with respect to that person who's asking the opinion, but it's also informal guidance to everyone else who's trying to understand, um, understand, uh, you know, the application of a provision. So uh, the Bar Association, they're not named in advisory opinion 457, uh, you know, wrote a uh, letter to the campaign finance board asking for clarity on about 15 to 20 different examples. Uh, and the response came out last week. People who practice in this area like I do spend a lot of time going through these examples, trying to look for guidance to give folks. Uh, since rules haven't been promulgated yet. And so I thought it'd be worth running through a few of them uh, be, that I think might relate to the groups on this call. So the first one is, uh, that should be comments, propo conveying proposed comments to a comprehensive plan or zone, zoning ordinance to city officials if the city requested it. And the campaign finance board says that's lobbying uh, because the amendments are are, uh, are an attempt to influence an official decision. Uh, uh, the fact that the city is either generally or specifically re requesting comments on the plan doesn't change the purpose of the proposed amendments, and, and you have triggered uh, lobbyist registration requirements. Um, conveying objections to an interim, interim ordinance uh, prohibiting development of land, uh, that would be considered lobbying, uh, since, um, uh, there's a vote of elected officials involved, uh, contacting the county auditor on behalf of a property owner to reset, request a single parcel identification number can be lobbying, depending on whether the county auditor is elected or, um, elected or appointed and whether the at, you know requesting the number is either discretionary or administrative so if the county ad, uh, auditor has the discretion to to assign it uh, that is more like <coughs> excuse me will trigger lobbying as opposed to if there's a statute or a county or city ordinance that basically says it has to be granted if you fill out a form and pay the fee uh, the next page, please. Uh, representing a real estate developer before a city or county planning uh, commission, that depends. Uh, depends on the makeup of the commission. Uh, depends on if the commission has the authority to uh, make decisions regarding uh, regarding the expenditure of money, and it depends on whether they're going to how they're going to be conveying uh, their. Uh, view of a particular issue to a city council or county board. Um, so there's different ways and there's like four scenarios that they set out there. I, I won't walk through all of them, but uh, this one is a good example of it, these determinations are fact specific. They're going to depend on uh, a certain number of variables each and every time you're interacting and they will require some uh, understanding of, you know, what a commission planning commission's role is with respect to approvals, what their authority is and who's sitting on the commission. Uh, if you're representing a real estate. Yeah. Donovan, sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Phil Cat and I'll call him. How does this apply if you're like a developer, you know, representing your company? Uh, because this developers were in front of planning and city councils on a pretty regular basis. Yeah. Well, if they're they're interacting with if they're interacting with uh, a planning commission, and the planning commission has elected officials on it, and the, the purpose of the interaction is is to get something approved that assists in developing the project, and, and that's part of what you pay the, those individuals for. They're now going to trigger lobbyist registration and reporting. So, um, so yeah, so that's so, a yes, right? That's a yes. That's a yes. Correct. And again, it, it, so it depends. Phil, you are no longer a developer. You are, you're a lobbyist. lobbyist. Yeah. So if you're talking, Phil, I mean, if you're talking, if you're talking to a city planning commission, before you have those discussions, you have to analyze the makeup of the commission to understand if there are either elected officials on it or local officials on it. 
you have to analyze what what the planning commission decision is and how whether they're going to convey that to a city council or county board. And if they are, then the planning commission is you're urging others to talk to the to the other elected officials. Uh, and then, um, you know, you have to, you know, analyze what the authority of the commission is. And based on that analysis in each and every instance, you have then have to decide. And I'd assume, you know, a lot of the folks like you, that's a lot of what you do. You're probably tr getting paid three more than 3000 from all sources or from your employer to, to trigger that. So it really, part of this is really understanding before you engage in these interactions, uh, you know, doing an assessment of who you're talking to, what you're talking to them about, what their authority is and what, what, you know, if it isn't a city council or a county board, which is a lot more cut and dried, if you're dealing with a planning commission, a historical preservation commission, a parking commission, and, and some of those are in here too, uh, what their authority is before you engage. Um, so, uh, you know, real estate developers at city council meetings who want a variance, uh, they're all low, you know, because those officials are elected. Uh, and a variance is an official action. Uh, you trigger it. You know, you represent a group of your neighbors at a town board meeting who don't want a conditional use uh, uh, permit, uh, assuming that they paid you $3,000. Uh, uh, you trigger lobbyist registration. So uh, all of these examples assume that one way or the other, you've triggered 3000 So, you know, if you you know, you, it could apply to something where you get paid 3000 from your neighbors to, to, you know, spend some time working on something and you've now become a lobbyist. Uh, next page, please. So, uh, you know, downtown business owners before city hysteria, uh, city His heritage preservation commission, you know, uh, the funds, you know, again, are a major expenditure of money. They're, they're obviously, if it's a, you know, parking uh, expenditure or, you know, ex any meaningful expenditure, I think the board's going to consider that a, um, uh, they're going to consider that a major expenditure. Uh, you know, I think it, if it's a minor expenditure, a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks, you might have an argument there, but for the most part, anything that, involves purchasing property or, <clears throat> you know, buying a theater, uh, building a parking ramp. Those are all major expenditures of funds. So uh, negotiating a development contract with city or county planning staff. This was one internally that a lot of our real estate lawyers were like, I'm now a lobbyist and, and, and they couldn't believe it. But, uh, uh, you know, if the public funds are needed for the infrastructure, then it's major use of funds. And the key thing here is this can apply to appointed officials and city and county employees. And each city and county employee has some ability to designate to the board who those folks are. So if you go look for like, the, I haven't looked since the law has been implemented, but I do some work in the city of Minneapolis and I've had to go look at that in the past and it is an extensive list. So I just want to have people keep in mind that that a resource uh, for you to look at if you're trying to determine whether these folks are going to be subject to lobbyist registration or reporting on the government side is there is a resource at the campaign finance board where you can look and see how the city is or the county has designated those folks. Others don't not designate them. So my guess is, is if you're dealing with somebody in Carver County, that's going to be a much smaller list that they've designated. If they've designated anyone at all, then it will be in Minneapolis or Bloomington or, or St. Paul. So I just picked about eight or nine of them that I thought were the most relevant, but this opinion has about 10 more. So uh, next, can we go to the next page, please? Oh, I, I there are actually a couple more. So these, these uh, involve meeting with county planning directors to, you know, to review a proposed preliminary plat. This is an example of where if you're just trying to get information, you may not have to register as a lobbyist. But if, uh, you know, the county uh, planning director has the ability to recommend a decision regarding the expenditure of public money, 
uh, and the purpose of the meeting is to influence that any of that decision, then you have to register. But if you're just trying to understand uh, uh, a multifamily housing unit, then you probably don't have to register. And then finally, uh, you know, meeting with a city engineer to negotiate street street improvements because again, they have some ability to make uh, major decisions regarding the expenditure of public funds and are considered a local official and you're talking to them about a street improvement. So my hope is, is if, you know, through these examples, people understand that this is a significant change in the law uh, at the local level with respect to local government interaction uh, and is something that, uh, you know, we, Donovan and I wanted you to be aware of, um, uh, because it, it's pretty broad and all encompassing. Uh, so maybe go to the next slide. Um, yeah, we can move on to the next one. I, um, that's just uh, one last example. So here are the implications of being a lobbyist uh, in Minnesota, which, you know, uh, I think Roz and Donovan and I know, but not everybody understands, is once you register as a lobbyist, uh, you have certain registrate, you know, re reporting, uh, reporting obligations. Uh, that's June 15th and January 15th. As I said earlier, uh, they've changed what has to be reported. It's going to be a lot more specific now. And, uh, and it's going to require, you know, documenting uh, at the local level interactions with every, um, every local official. Uh, in terms of the city, in terms of the official action, and in terms of the subject matter. So it's a much more of a, a burdensome uh, reporting requirement than it was in the past. Uh, the, the, uh, another big one is, is that the company becomes a lobbyist principal, which means you have a reporting requirement uh, once a year that isn't quite as onerous or burdensome as the lobbyist reporting but you now have a reporting requirement once somebody triggers that because not only does the lobbyist have to file uh, reporting uh, uh, requirements, the, the, the employer does as well, but you do not, the lobbyist principal does not file a registration. So there's no registration requirement for a lot the employer, the lobbyist principal. The big one is the state's gift ban. So once you, or any employee, you know, once an employee of your company registers as a lobbyist, you are now subject to the state's gift ban, which means you cannot make a gift of any um, thing of value to any local and state elected official. You know, I think currently, if you're working at the local level, there are some local uh, restrictions based on if you're going to benefit from a decision of a local unit of government, you have a more limited uh, gift ban with respect to gifts to those individuals, but um, but now it's to everybody in the state who's a public official, and that can be problematic because that also applies like if you know if you're going to a wedding and you know your buddy is a elected official or a high level appointed official in some other country or county, uh, and you want to provide you know the the groom and bride with a gift that could violate the state's gift ban. It's pretty, pretty all encompassing and it is uh, not a lot of exceptions there. And some of the advisory opinions, when you go look at it, I mean, the fact that you had pre-existing personal relationships with these folks doesn't enter into it. Uh, so it's just important to understand that once, if you have not already been designated a lobbyist principal, that once you trigger this, you are now, uh, you are now uh, subject to the state's gift ban. And then there are also restrictions on political contributions. Uh, you cannot make political contributions to state officials and constitutional officers during session. And on every contribution you make, you have to uh, put your lobbyist registration number uh, on the contribution. So those are some of the implications to keep in mind. Uh, uh, as folks now navigate becoming lobbyists and lobbyist principals uh, at the local level. So next steps for the, the board is there's still a lot of uh, questions. Uh, there'll be a lot more advisory opinions that will, I am assuming, be issued. You know, I've had some conversations with the executive director of the campaign finance board, and uh, we did a presentation with him on this law uh, in November. 
Uh, he expects a lot more in the way of advisory opinions to flush this out. The board is also promulgating rules. Uh, there are a set of uh, administrative rules that do interpret uh, lobbyist registration and reporting. Those need to be updated, but they've been uh, out in the community trying to <coughs> understand potential implications, which they hope to you know, in address in the rules as well. So we'll keep you updated as those rules are promulgated and released. Um, and then the last is, is at some point, uh, and it may not be this session, there might be attempts uh, made to amend the law. Um, the campaign finance director has freely admitted that uh, that uh, he, there are some issues that have arisen uh, that may not be able to be uh, addressed uh, in administrative rulemaking. And, and the one that people use the most is the county attorney is an elected official. And if you're a criminal defense lawyer and you're trying to get the county attorney to do a plea deal, does, have you now become a lobbyist? Well, under the plain letter of the law, you have. That's not one I don't think they can fix by, by uh, 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 rules because you know it's pretty clear the county attorney is either elected or high level, you know, an elected county attorney in many areas. Uh, you know, it's clearly an official action of a county attorney to make these decisions. And um, so, um, so those are the kinds of things that they might have to go back and fix. Uh, and there's just going to be a significant administrative burden put on the agency to try to, to not only communicate to folks uh, what their new obligations are, but to, uh, but to actually process all of this. So with that, uh, it's a lot of information I know. I'm happy to try and answer any questions, but I think, our, our, you know, Donovan and I and NIOP's hope was just to get this on your radar screen. You know, this presentation, I'm happy to, I mean, certainly email it to at the group or whoever, um, you know, looking at those examples, hopefully we'll at least, you know, provide some guidance. Um, but wanted to make sure people understood, uh, you know, this is a pretty significant change. Hey, Dave, I got a quick question. You know, what is, what do you think the legislators were trying to accomplish with this legislation? What was the purpose behind it? Well, I think, you know, uh, I think it's a couple different things. There were some of these changes and, and this is part of a broader law that hadn't been able to get adopted uh, for a while. So I think like in a lot of other areas, Democrats felt like um, this was their chance to, to you know, make significant changes uh, while they controlled uh, all branches of government. I think, you know, some of it, frankly, is a function of younger members who haven't thought through all the implications of this. <laughs> and so, you know, it sounds really good, uh, you know, to enact it into law, but you know, there were reasons that that local government lobbying was more restricted in the first place, um, because, you know, I'm assuming this was before my time. This was, you know, this was a post Watergate law. Right. Uh, the original version was, you know, there'd been some thought put into uh, why you wouldn't have such an expansive law at the state level. Uh, and so they, they limited it, you know, they didn't want to have this massive burden, uh, you know, if you're going to go talk to a township about a variance as a lawyer, you know, they're not, not expecting to be a, 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 you know, a lobbyist. I mean, I think they were, you know, originally trying to get it, frankly, people like Donovan and I, you know, who get paid by people to influence action. We're making political contributions. We're doing stuff and they want, they wanted a letter, uh, level of transparency and disclosure. Uh, here, I don't think they thought through some of that. And in a session where they're passing so many other things, uh, they, I think, started with what the campaign finance board had been recommended and expanded on it. Hey, Dave, uh, Sean here. I, I've got a bunch of questions. I think my first question is, um, and, and I'll let other people respond as, or ask questions too, but I mean, I, I think of all the neighborhood groups in Minneapolis and St. Paul, have they, I mean, I, I can't imagine they're, they, they either know about this or, I mean, 
you know, this just seems to me like the heart of their constituency is going to be kind of, you know, really affected by this. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it's, uh, and it'll be again, interesting to see the, 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 uh, what the rules say, but I think, you know, if it's neighborhood groups, you know, the group itself, if they're, you know, if they're paying somebody, you know, anything, and part of it is to interact with the city, they're now, you know, many of them may find out they've now become uh, lobbyists and are subject to this reporting. Uh, the neighbors themselves maybe triggered the $3,000 uncompensated individual thing, but probably doubtful in most instances. But yeah, I think, you know, as people are learning about this law and these changes, um, you know, I think there'll be more questions asked of folks. Um, you know, and, and the one thing I would say is, you know, nonprofits have been traditionally treated a little better with respect to the campaign finance laws in the state than, than corporations uh, and for-profit entities. They get a little bit of a break. Um, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a big, potentially a big change for them. Hey, Dave, I got a quick question, and maybe you just answered part of it as it relates to uncompensated individuals. But uh, if, if, your, if your potential compensation, compensation is prospective, like you're not being paid anything um, to participate in the upfront process, um, it only happens, you know, on a success uh, fee basis in the future. Does that, does that come into play here at all? This is my first question. I've got follow-up, too. Yeah, well, there's two things. Uh, first of all, is um, if you're not being compensated, uh, you know, the three thousand uh, is is ill defined. I think you know, and I've actually said this to to the ED executive director. I think they would do well to start providing guidance with respect to in-house calculations of how you reach three thousand. You know, in my discussions with Gary. It's clear you got to do some calculation based on, you know, job description, uh, based on how much time, you know, a reasonable time limit the you know, this person's job is, you know, um, interacting with folks. But, you know, especially now that it's such a bigger deal, um, you know, the, I, I think that issue is right for an advisory opinion to get guidance because, you know, some of the clients Donovan and I work with, you know, if they want to have a lobbyist day at the Capitol, right? And depending on who shows up, is that person going to trigger a lobbyist registration, uh, you know, reporting if you're CEO of a bank and you want to go to bank day, you know, and part of your job is to be out in the community. Did you just, you know, trigger, <laughs> you're now a lobbyist. Um, so I think that's an issue. The other thing I would just tell you is you got to be careful about, uh, you know, uh, success fees uh, because contingent fee lobbying in Minnesota is, is a criminal offense. So uh, that, does, you know, so if and, and that's a little bit more restrictive, but I just want you to know what's out there that, you know, uh, if you are getting compensated based on the outcome of a of a uh, of a official action of a board that that can create a different kind of liability. No, I appreciate that. I, pro I probably used the wrong term from a legal standpoint, but our, our success fees are based on a completion of a you know, new development, yeah. lease up and future sale. It's not, it uh -huh. doesn't have anything to do with the decision made by, um, by a public yeah. entity. So okay. then, so then I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think through this from all our service lines. So obviously we've got brokers that deal with cities regularly. Um, yeah. And then we've got property managers that on a project specific basis might have to deal with the, with a, a public uh, governmental authority. And, oh. and then even project managers with dealing with building inspectors, um, you know, I, I, trying to be prospective or the, if, if we've got people that are regularly interacting, is there a, a proactive approach that we should just say, Hey, we got to do this. And, we're going to do it for these people because they're regularly in, in these conversations and not make a case by case uh, decision as to whether to register or not. And then when we have unique situations, then use the approach that you uh, suggested, which is to analyze the risk reward um, element of it. Yeah, Mike, I think that's the right approach. Uh, I think others who are trying, you know, there are groups like yours, railroads, 
uh, lots of folks that have a lot of interaction with local governments. And, you know, they have taken, you know, the advice has been to be proactive in identifying the people that are making these decisions, uh, get them registered, uh, educate them on what that means for them, uh, and, and being upfront with respect to most, uh, most, uh, you know, most of those employees that are where you kind of know. Uh, and then they, have along with that, have kind of tried to implement some kind of a reporting mechanism where any other employee is, uh, you know, needs to report to somebody, some compliance individual, every contact they have with a uh, local government official. So then you can make a decision about, uh, you know, make a decision about whether they're lobbyists. So, I mean, if you've got folks that are dealing with lower, you know, I think the lower level, the staff. Uh, and, uh, you know, the the purpose of the communication is important there. So if you have lower level folks that, you know, work with code enforcement or something, they let them in, they're not arguing for a particular outcome and they're dealing with somebody that doesn't make major uh, expenditures of, uh, make decisions regarding major expenditures, then those folks are probably okay. But I think the, uh, the reporting obligation for those folks who are not registered um, uh, you know, internally, uh, is a good compliance step. Thank you. It, uh, this is a follow-up question to that, um, is the major expenditure, I mean, is that defined as, so let's, let's use Mike's example. I mean, if we put up a new industrial building and we don't have any public financing involved, it's all private capital, it, where does what's the major expenditure trigger? I'm not trying to get too technical on it. I'm just trying to understand because it seems to me like every developer realistically then is now going to have to, you know, come in as a lobbyist, which seems to me to miss the mark. I mean, for everything that we do is, a, is in a public forum for the most part. I mean, anyone can go to the meetings for with the planning commission or city council when we're, you know, advancing a project. Yeah. You know, I, again, uh, this really underscores the nature of it's a case by case determination. So if you have a project where you're not asking for, you know, tax abatement or TIF districts or anything where there's money, uh, you know, that's a different situation than one where you are, obviously. And that has, I think, uh, implications for the analysis with respect to being a local government official, you know. But if you're asking for a variance and you're talking to city council members uh, or the city manager or somebody, you know, you might trigger it another way. Right. Uh, so because there are multiple different triggers. So I think Who that's forces it? the campaign finance board. And, you know, how would you I mean, how, how, how would you I mean, so what happens if you just make an honest oversight and you didn't file and what are the what are the repercussions? Well, I mean, there are legal repercussions uh, if you don't file and the purpose of fine, there can be criminal liability if it's willful. But the, the campaign finance board has traditionally not been a gotcha entity. You know, um, if you find out you should have registered earlier, they want you in compliance and that's their main goal. Uh, so, you know, if somebody just inadvertently triggers it, and then you figure it out a couple months later, you know, there's a way to work with the board on that to make sure that, you know, you're okay. Uh, but the other place where this will often happen is something that's high profile and controversial, right? Where people are trying to play gotcha. So there's also a brand management and, and you know, uh, uh, how I don't know, brand management issue. There's also, does it impact whatever official action you're in is if somebody finds out you didn't register and then tries to use that against you with a, in the press and with a county board. So. Hey, Dave, Thank you. That's a um, great point. If, if you have a company or an organization, for example, NAOP, you know, assumably just like, you know, your real estate license or other type of things, can can one is there one person that can start to register you as a as as a lobbyist or get all the proper paperwork? And kind of where I'm going with that is maybe NAOP can be that for our members and we can develop something for that. Um, 
Just a thought. Yeah, I think, you know, I think there is a role for NIOP uh, by, you know, maybe putting together a template of, uh, uh, for something member companies can use, but the actual registration reporting obligations are local to each company. So, I mean, you know, like if, you know, somebody has to sign their lobbyist registration form and, and do their, you know, twice a year uh, lobbyist uh, reporting forms, that has to be done by the individuals that are the lobbyist. Uh, the lobbyist principal once a year has to be done and signed by uh, by somebody at the company. Um, but, you know, uh, in terms of providing advice and and things like this, that's something that we can definitely do. I have a question. This kind of piggybacks on Phil's comment and Dave, you kind of touched on it. What, how is this going to be tracked? I feel like there's a lot of people that could kind of slip into this role unintentionally. I'm just wondering, you know, Phil had asked about the implications. I'm wondering how that's, how that's going to be monitored. Well, yeah, you know, the board, again, the board, it's been my experience and, you know, I'll freely admit we have done it a long time and once or twice I thought somebody had, you know, cause we have an electronic signature and file lobbyist registration form and hadn't, you know, especially now the campaign finance board has so much uh, to do that they, they are not like the MPCA or something where they got people going out trying to audit companies. Right. So I don't think you have to worry too much about, you know, somebody from the campaign finance board, just, you know, showing up at your door uh, going, Hey, are you a lobbyist? Uh, you know, uh, and if you determine it internally and then comply, uh, you know, they're very pretty lenient because they want compliance. They're not trying to be an enforcement agency. Uh, but if, you know, again, getting to an example where, you know, maybe somebody's working on a project for two years and it's a controversial project and someone on the other side sees your employee there all the time and then finds out they're not registered that's when you could be subjected to fines or other types of liability. Uh, you know, I think criminal liability, you know, I, I don't, I'm not aware of there ever being a criminal liability, you know, issue with respect to filing for a lobbyist, but it's like a willful, like, Hey, we want you to comply. And, you know, we're asking you to comply and you're not complying and providing us the information, right. That's when you kind of have a tougher instance. And then the same, you know, lobbyist print and the, with respect to the room. So that's the registration side on the reporting side. I mean, the board does have a process. So if, you know, once you're registered, if you haven't uh, filed the reports on time, they start sending you notices and then you can start racking up some administrative fees. Uh, but I don't know if that's helpful, but that's, that's kind of how I, I think it works in practice or how I've seen it work in practice. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And the gift ban, I mean, that's an important one. You know, if you're going to start registering this, it's just important for them to understand that, you know, the gift ban is, is, uh, is pretty comprehensive. Uh, and that's the one I think is going to be a surprise too, because, you know, if you're working on one project in Minneapolis and, you know, you have a friend that is, in government and somehow is, you know, subject to the state's gift ban, you know, that, that means food and drink, that means wedding gifts, that means all sorts of things, you know, you invite them over for dinner, you got to ask them, you know, technically you got to ask them for a check for their share of food and drink. And it's, so. Peter Coyle. Peter Coyle. Hey, Pete. Uh, uh, Mike Holmes asked a really, really good question, which I think NIAP ought to consider putting in front of the board as an advisory opinion request. And that's the commission broker role, because every broker has a contingent fee arrangement, whether they call it that or not. That's the outcome of their project, right? Right. And, I, and, and there is, as you know, a prohibition statute on contingent fee agreements. Right. For a lot of people that are lobbyists, and it'd be helpful, I think, to get that clarified, because that's a 
you know, whether that would ever become an issue. You could imagine it becoming something more politically sensitive for a really big project. Yeah. Where there are brokerage arrangements that generate, you know, as they as they are intended to, uh, commission payouts at the end of a project if it gets approved, and that's obviously a contingency. So yeah. I, it there ought to at least be some discussion among NIAP about whether or not that's something to get clarified in statute if it needs to be clarified, or in terms of any rulemaking that occurs. So I just offer that up as a thought. Yeah, no, no, that's a good observation. And for others on the call, um, you know, I, Pete knows this and worked in this area as well. The, you know, we, you can ask these questions anonymously, uh, but, you know, another way to ask these questions so that you aren't, um, you know, you can't be identified, you know, by the facts that are put forth is to do it through an association. I mean, like this entire, all these examples I provided were, you know, they didn't say the bar association, but you could tell it was the bar association. But that way, you know, there's an extra, extra kind of layer there of anonymity um, to try and get clarity without putting yourself out front and center. So there's ways to navigate it. But yeah, given the level of expansion, it's certainly something I think folks ought to think about. Dave, it might be too early to have an opinion on this, but when you look at these public officials and how they've traditionally operated, um, I mean, part of their goal is to is to spur development in tax base in their communities. And um, we've got a lot of relationships with a lot of people over over decades, right? Right. Any any sense for how this is gonna? We know how it's gonna upset our world uh, with more details to follow from a rule standpoint but any sense on how the people on the ground that are elected officials or appointed officials with authority are responding to this legislation you know i i i think that that's a tougher one sorry you know i think part of it is this thing just became effective in january um you know it's 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 been effective for a week or so I think as we get more into reporting uh, and, you know, we people become more aware of this, uh, I think, you know, more and more people will, uh, you know, will have an opinion about the breadth of this or what needs to be fixed. I also think, you know, another p potential might be where is, you know, the county association AMC and this League of Cities going to be uh, because it does, you know, a lot of this interaction, you know, as you know, has never been subject to lobbyist registration and reporting and, and you know, the, the normal attorney relationships with these folks, you know, is pretty important for them to get information, you know, and they're trying to build their city tax base, as you know, right? So they have an interest in this as well. But um, at least from my perspective, it's a little premature to understand how they're all going to view it. Um uh, because I don't think you're not going to really see the impacts of this. I mean, I think it's going to become more apparent over the next few months as, you know, as we get further down the line on implementation. Yeah, that's fair, fair enough. That's what I thought you were going to say. We, we actually get invited in, get members of our team invited in to speak to cities <laughs> and planning right. commissions about market conditions and, you know, trends and what they should be thinking about and what market demand exists in each different property sector. So, we're going to have to reevaluate most of what we do when interacting with those entities. Right. Yeah. I mean, if they're, it's, it's interesting dynamic, they're reaching out to you to try and develop something. Right. And then, you know, all of a sudden, you know, that you're triggering these things when you're trying to work cooperatively. I think the other area, I mean, real estate's a big one. The other one is really the nonprofit uh, world. You know, I don't, I don't do a lot in that area. But that's the other area where I see while wow, people are going, you know, I'm working with the city on getting a, a grant or something. And all of a sudden I've triggered, you know, I've triggered a bunch of registration reporting that maybe I didn't know I was going to do lawyers and, and, you know, NGOs. So. Well, I see, excuse me. See, we're pushing up on nine. I think Sean might have fallen off the call. But Dave, maybe just kind of one final wrap up and just to verify if you're hearing the same thing from me. 
but for others on the call, there is also a Minnesota Government Relations Council, which is an organization of lobbyists that has worked on these issues with campaign finance. It's my understanding that they are still meeting with them, kind of like Dave said, learning the new law, hopefully looking at ways to revise that. You know, who knows if they're successful, but I have heard that's been possibly taking place too. I don't know if you know of that too or not. Yeah, I, uh, uh, you know, I, I think there are multiple things uh, that has to uh, um, have to occur. Uh, you know, this isn't the end of the discussion, and part of it is uh, is the rulemaking. Part of it is subsequent legislative action. Uh, you know, there are discussions with the board ongoing with legis key legislators, uh, and so, you know, I think there are a few more. Uh, you know, this isn't the end of it, um, but uh, as of now, this is kind of where where it's at. So, um, you know, happy to get this presentation sent out to everybody who's on the call and others. Uh, no pride of authorship here, <laughs> but uh, and and we'll keep you updated on this as it moves forward. And uh, happy to always answer other questions if we can be helpful. Roz or Stephanie, final, I think Steph or Roz, if you can acknowledge, I think February 1st is our next meeting and Senator Rest has, uh, since she was unable to make it to this time, has offered to come to that one. So we'll be planning to reschedule her there, but I don't know, Roz or Steph, anything, last comments? No, that sounds great. And um, yeah, a lot of good information. These slides will be shared with the group as well. <laughs> and uh, we look forward to hearing from Senator Ann Rust on February 1st. Yep, you'll get an email from us uh, today or tomorrow with the slides. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, very Thanks. informative, folks. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good Thanks, day, everyone. everyone. Yep, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.